You're listening to another life-transforming message from Awakened Church with campuses in San Diego and Salt Lake City. To find out more about us, go to awakenchurch.com. Full transparency, when I first heard John preach, it was the second week that I was here, uh, almost eight years ago, and he preached a message called Vision Accomplished. And I was so offended. (laughs) Because I was used to church coming to church and hearing information that would make me wise. And I have a huge heart for evangelism. So I would hear a message and then I would go and preach that message to all my friends. And it wasn't just about me. Honestly, I really, really have a heart to see people get saved and set free. But I came and heard that message. And that message wasn't just informational. It was transformational. It was asking me to act. And it was asking me to act in a way where there was still a ceiling over my life and it made me uncomfortable. So it was easier for me to be like, oh my gosh, who gave that guy a microphone? (laughs) I had heard Becky preach and I was like, Pastor Becky was like just my heart. And I was like, oh my gosh, transformation. It's so relevant. She's so amazing, so transparent. But John was like, power? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And so I made him wrong for a while. And I I really thought that it was just like, maybe it was an off week or just a message that was not in the style. But I re-listened to that message recently and it's freaking incredible. But it's such a call to actually do something. And as Christians, it's like Christ sacrificed his life for us. Then he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us so that we can actually be the fulfillment of the prayer that he teaches us to pray of God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're meant to be the ones that pull heaven to earth and make the earth a reflection of heaven. We're not just meant to find out information. We're meant to be the, the hands and the feet of Christ, not on our own power, but on his. So anyway, This message has been like a process for me. And sometimes God will have me in a process for a while. Does anybody else ever feel like they're in a process with God? And sometimes they think I want off this train. So I'll tell you just real quick, 2000, and we'll get, we'll get to this in, uh, we're going to go into Genesis seven. I I promise we'll get to scripture in just a second, but I'm going to tell you this story. So in 2018, our church hosted a, a conference called Empower. And in addition to leading the recovery ministry, I'm also on a team called the chaperone team. So occasionally I get to host other speakers that are visiting and other pastors that come in. And it's a huge honor because so many of these men of God are like generals in the faith. And some of them are like my faith heroes. And I, and I don't take it lightly. It's an honor. But in June of 2018, we were hosting Empower. I was sitting in the seat where Pastor Quacha is right now. And Colby Gardner was sitting right next to me. And we had just been announced that instead of Empower the following year, we were hosting a much larger conference called Presence Americas. And Colby gets this text and I see her feverishly texting back. And then she turns to me and she said, we just confirmed Erwin McManus for Presence next year. Do you want to drive him? And I'm like, oh boy, I felt like a kid on Christmas. And not because I'm some weird pastor groupie, (laughs) but because of who of who he is, how he's lived his life and and the books, especially that he's written. I don't know him personally, but he wrote a book called The Artisan Soul. And it gave me permission to be creative and be holy, be the unique thumbprint that God created me to be and be unapologetic about it, to be a total intellectual, but still be totally scriptural and to believe God above my own mind. There are all of these things that was like, were given permission to me by his work and his art. And I'm an artist and he's an artist and he's a futurist. And I have a a creative agency called prophetic. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like a match made in heaven. So I could have not been more excited. And for the next 14 months, she's seeding little bits of information to me and saying, how's my number one fanboy doing? And I'm like, stop calling me that, please, for the love of God. 
Two days before the conference, I get an email, and the email has a little block of, of text, and then there's a PDF attached for it, and it's, it's the chaperone email for the conference. It's telling us where we, where we need to go, what we need to do, and I'd taken time off work. I'm so excited about all of this, and, and uh, I open up the email, and it says, okay, the Hillards are looking after the Pringles, and Mike is looking after Erwin McManus. And I'm looking after, how do I pronounce this name? Gentison Franklin. Who is that? <laughs> and I'm like, clearly Colby has an assistant. She just, she must have transposed the names. And then I open up the PDF and I look at the PDF and everywhere that it talks about person and chaperone, I'm with this Gentison Franklin character. And I look him up on the internet and I find a picture of him and he's got like a, a tailored suit and, and a nice, a nice crisp shirt. <laughs> and, and my friend, Mike, who's chaperoning, Erwin McManus, Mike has nice crisp shirts and tailored blazers. And I don't. And so I text Colby and I say, LOL. I think there's been a typo. <laughs> and she says, no typo. Pastor Leanne thought the two of you would be better suited with the other speaker. It's her call. And it's an honor either way. I didn't say it wasn't an honor, but 14 months. I'm not looking for like a long conversation. I am happy to serve, but God, I'm disappointed. And then I start to think. What did she mean that I'd be better off with the other speaker? Does she not trust me with him? Does she think I'm going to be weird and have an awkward long conversation that I'm going to demand attention? <laughs> Do they like Mike better than me? I mean, he's such a diligent servant. He's so good. He's got such an incredible heart. Maybe he asked. Maybe he asked. I bet he asked. <laughs> Mike's my friend. And he's always nice to my face, but I don't know I'll be able to look him in the face again after this. And Pastor Leanne, I know she trusts me. She asked me to speak at Cherish, so it was either Mike or it was Colby. Maybe Mike asked. Leanne said yes. And then Colby didn't come to my defense. And I'm telling you, I swear to you that this is all going on in my head. And my wife comes into my office. I'm staring at the computer screen. And I know it sounds incredibly petty. But I'm staring at the computer screen and I looked like someone had died. And she comes in and asks me what's wrong. And as she asks me, my lip starts to quiver and I really get choked up because I'm thinking that I don't know these people that I care about, that somehow they think more about themselves than they do about me. And nobody knows how important this was to me. And so my wife says, well, Leanne loves you. Why don't you just text her? And I think, well, she's at Hillsong conference right now, which is in Sydney, which is 15 hours ahead of here. It's 11 o'clock here. So it would be like three o'clock in the afternoon. So she'll totally be, it'll probably be in between sessions. This is the perfect time to text. And I pull out my phone and I start texting and the Holy spirit says, stop. And sometimes I'll hear from God. I don't hear loud booming voices from the heavens, but I'll just get a gut check. I'll just get a thought that like somehow overpowers all the other thoughts in my mind. And that thought right then was to stop. And so I turned to my wife and says, I, I feel like I need to go pray. So I went and prayed and the Holy spirit asked me some questions. He said, do you believe your pastors love you? And I said, yeah, I know they love me. do you believe that they hear from me? And I said, yeah, I, I know they hear from you. I've like literally staked my life on, on that. I, I know that they do. Well then, 
are you willing to not be the kid that's opened all his Christmas presents two weeks before Christmas and rewrap them and now has to pretend to be surprised on Christmas Day? I guarantee you I would not have thought about that for myself. But I'm like, yeah, I'm willing. And then I start to get a little excited. Like, I wonder what's going to happen. And so the conference rolls around. And I get a call saying that Pastor Jensen is actually only going to be there for Wednesday night because he has to fly out and pray with the president in Washington, D.C. And he has to fly out right after he gets off stage. So just be quick with the turnarounds with him. And I'm like, I'm totally okay with everything. God had changed my heart. And I find that when you really purpose to trust God, that it doesn't really matter what happens because you know that he's working for you. I just had to get over myself. And so like I'm, I show up at his car and I open the door for him and I greet him. Hi, hi, I'm, I'm Morgan Irvin. I'm going to be your, your chaperone. He's like, Oh, hi, I'm Jensen. It's a pleasure to meet you. Morgan, what do you do here at the church? Are you, are you a pastor? Do you lead a, a campus? And I said, no, my, my wife and I lead the recovery ministry. He's like, Oh, that's wonderful. And do you ever get a chance to preach? And I'm like, yeah, actually I, I do. And he's like, well, when are you preaching next? And I told him that I was, I was preaching at the Cherish conference and he asked me about my message and just put his arm around my shoulder and walked with me. And he didn't have to. I mean, I was there just to like, I was just there to serve him in whatever way I, I could, but he insisted on investing in me. And we had this conversation about my message and he is just the most incredible, incredible, incredibly kind human being that invests in people. And so we talk and I take him to the stage and I take him from the stage back to his seat. And as he's getting off the stage after delivering the most incredible message, if you were at that conference, if you weren't at that conference, it's called the power, the power of little, um, uh, the power of little by little. And it talks about God working things out little by little. Cause sometimes if he gives us to us all at once, it would overwhelm us and it would disable us. So he talks about the power of little by little. For me, it was the message of the conference and I'm leading him off stage. And he says, Morgan, remind me to talk to you. I was thinking about your message and I, I'm wondering, have you considered Noah? I just think I have something for you, but remind me when we're walking back to the hotel and I'm thinking, well, when, when did you, when were you thinking about my message? Because I've been with you literally the entire time, except for when you were on stage. And so by now there's a huge group of pastors that are around us. And he again, puts his arm around my shoulder and walks us away from the crowd. And just, he says to me, you know, Noah, it took incredible faith and incredible vision to do what Noah did that they, they say that he was building the ark for over a hundred years. And in Jewish tradition, they believe that he grew the trees before he cut them down to make the plants, to make the ark. How much vision, how much trust in God's plan would you have to do to do that? And then he builds this boat that's the size of a football stadium. It's one and a half times the length of a football field. And it has enough space that if the average animal was the size of a lamb and it had a decent sized pen, you could fit 125 lamb, 125,000 lamb sized animals on that boat. To put it in perspective, the San Diego Zoo and the Safari Park together have 6,500 animals. I used to wonder about the math on the ark. There's not that many species in the world and you could have fit them all in there. But I'm, I'm, I'm listening to him talk about this. And he said, you know, he prepared for so long. And then the largest storm, well, the only storm ever at that point, but the storm to end all storms came and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And he knew because God told him it would rain for 40 days and 40 nights. But at the end of the storm, the Bible says that they drifted and people can get so discouraged in the drift. They can be preparing for something, knowing that something's going to come, be prepared for that, but not be prepared for the drift afterwards. And sometimes people get so discouraged. And then he got in his car and drove off. And I went back to my car and I opened up the Bible and read Genesis six to Genesis nine. And I saw all of these things that I had never seen before in there. And so come with me in your 
uh, in your Bible. Uh, my message today, by the way, is called Shift the Drift. And I feel like we're in a drift season right now. There was like two weeks to flatten the curve, and then there's just been a drift. And it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to make excuses when you're in a drift. But I want to unpack some of this for you. So come in with me to your, in your Bibles to Genesis 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with your whole family. I have found that you are the only one in the whole world who does what is right. Take with you seven pairs of each kind of ritually clean animal, but only one pair of unclean animal. Take also seven pairs of each bird. Do this so that every animal and bird will be kept alive to reproduce again on the earth. Seven days from now, I'm going to send rain that will fall for 40 days and 40 nights in order to destroy all the living things that I have made. And Noah did everything that the Lord commanded. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came on the earth. Donna, you're young and those shoes are young lady heels. They are not old lady heels wherever you've gone. <laughs> Noah was 600 years old when the flood came on the earth. He and his wife and his sons and their wives went to the boat to escape the flood. A male and female of every kind of animal and bird, whether richly clean or unclean, went into the boat with Noah as God had commanded. Seven days later, the flood came when Noah was 600 years old on the 17th day of the second month, all of the outlets of the vast, vast body of water beneath the earth burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On that same day, Noah and his wife went into the boat with their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives with them, every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, and every kind of bird. A male and female of each kind of living beast went into the boat with Noah as God had commanded. Then the Lord shut the doors behind Noah. The flood continued for 40 days and the water became deep enough for the boat to float. The water became deeper and the boat drifted on the surface. Then in verse 24, it says the water did not start to go down for 150 days. You know, Aaron in, uh, when they're in the, the wilderness and Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai to meet with God, Aaron got discouraged after two weeks and started melting down all the Egyptian jewelry and building the golden calf. Yeah. At this point, they're on the boat for 190 days. There's the storm to end all storms. And this boat is giant, but it only has one window, which is closed. The world's largest zoo and all of Noah's in-laws. I don't know if you can imagine what it would be like with all of your in-laws on a dark, stinky vessel for half a year with no sign of what's going on. God just said it was going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't give like a part two to that story. Right. And then in verse eight, one of Genesis, it says, and then God remembered Noah. And I think sometimes I don't believe that he ever forgot him, but I know that when we're in the drift, that it can feel like God's forgotten about us. It can be like that little messenger window on iMessage with those three little blinking dots. You're like, did you just Holy ghost me? God. Sorry. Dad joke. Dad joke. Okay. So he didn't forget about them. They're the only people on earth. They're pretty hard to forget about them. Right. But storm down all storms, 40 days. And then the ark just drifts for 150 days. And at this point they're in the ark, the giant dark smelly ark with the biggest zoo ever and their in-laws. And they get stuck on the top of a mountain. It says the ark rested on the top of Mount Ararat, but it was still like a long time before the water would subside. So they could actually see what they had landed on. Now, instead of drifting, they're just stuck. And I made a little timeline to put it into perspective for you that this is the journey on the ark represented in colors. The blue part is where the flood starts and where the flood stops. This is pretty short. This is like two weeks to flatten the curve. And then the drift starts. (laughs) 
And though I don't agree with it, I give it some grace because I think people think they need to pretend like they know what they're doing when they don't. In this case, God actually did know what he was doing, but they're stuck on the top of Mount Ararat. And then they're stuck there for mm, another 40 days. And then Noah decides to send out a dove. And I know that God's moving today because I had a pretty tidy message prepared. And then at one 30 in the morning, God asked this question about this, this scripture. And so we'll pick it up in Genesis eight, six. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. It had been closed before then. So that's where I got that from. So then he sent out a raven, which keeps going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out for himself a dove. I had only ever heard about the dove. And my message is all tidy and I'm tired. And then I get this little from the Holy spirit. What about the Raven? What's up with the Raven? (laughs) So Moses also sent out for himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned to the ark for him for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited again another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him anymore. So I want to unpack this. The dove finding a place to land marks the end of the flood. The earth still needs a few months to dry out, but the flood is over now. And you know, in the Bible, the dove always represents the Holy spirit. And so I did a little word study on dove at two o'clock in the morning and found that there's actually only two places in the entire Bible where man actually interacts with a dove. Doves are mentioned a few times being sold and being used in things. But the only two times that man interacts with a dove is here in Genesis. And then again, when the, physical dove descended from the heavens as a physical manifestation of the Holy spirit landing on Jesus in Luke three, 21 and 22, it said when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens opened and the Holy spirit descended in bodily form, like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son in you. I am well pleased. In Genesis eight, it's the first time the doves mentioned, and I think it holds the secret for all of us to overcome the drifts in our life and really for overcoming any hardship in life. But the scripture also has a warning. And before Noah sends out the dove, he sends a raven out. And a raven is an unclean animal by biblical standards. A raven feeds on dead things. The raven you know, to me represents that um, compromise that sometimes after a season of drift of being stuck in a situation that's beyond your control, that's awful that you just feel like you have to endure, endure, endure. And Noah was in that season. I mean, when he finally gets off the ark, he makes a little altar, but then he plants a vineyard and gets wasted And I know that there's a bunch of people that have been in this season. My wife and I are over the recovery ministry that have just made concessions in their life just to be able to try to deal with what they're going through. And the Raven represents that in such a beautiful way, but is a warning. So being unclean, Noah only had two Ravens on the boat and he let one go. One pair, two of ravens, seven pairs, the number of God of doves. And he had to let one of the doves go so that there were only six, which is the number of man. And you see Noah letting the dove go and coming back. And when the dove doesn't have a place to land, Noah becomes that landing place for the dove. And I think in this scripture that Noah really represents the church. It's a place for the Holy spirit to come and land. And in the 
account in Genesis, the dove is with the ark the entire time. The Holy Spirit is always with God's people. He comes to live inside of us and he is the empowerment of the living God. And I've realized that when I haven't been able to hear God's voice or experience his presence, there's usually something in my life where I've turned away or gone away. And sometimes totally unintentionally, sometimes in totally a justified way. You know, when I was given this opportunity to chaperone Jensen Franklin, I almost said, no, I've got something else to do. I was so hurt and offended that it almost caused me to walk away from the thing that God had for me. And I think there's some of us that do that in times of just severe disappointment. And you look at the, that, that timeline that there's all of these things where something should have changed, but it just keeps going and going and going. And when's it going to stop? And at those times we need the church We need a place where the Holy Spirit can come and land and fill us up. Even when there is no, there's nothing that's not death in the world. We need a place for the presence of God to hover. And just like the Holy Spirit can only land on things that are alive. Sometimes there's things like the judgment of God represented by the flood that we've still got the judgment of God on us. And the Holy Spirit can't find a landing place on us. So we feel desperate and disconnected and are like, God, I'm showing up to church, but what's wrong? I can't hear you. I'm doing all of these things for you, but I can't hear you. I'm tithing. I'm giving above my tithe. I'm, I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing all these things. Where are you? I need your presence. I keep hearing pastors talk about power and I see other people getting break through and transformation, but where's mine? I found personally in my life, there are five things that will block me from hearing God and will give the Holy spirit a place where he can't land. And I just want to talk to you about those in the couple of minutes that we have left. If we can't hear God's voice or feel his presence I just want to ask you today, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in this. Just ask yourself these questions if any of them are true for you. Is there an unhealthy habit in my life that I won't give up? I know that there have been mine in during the pandemic. I definitely wasn't exercising in the way that I'm used to and probably gained that COVID-19 and made excuses around all of that, but not feeling like I'm, I'm really experiencing God to his fullness. You know, and if my body is a temple for the Holy Spirit to live in, and I'm putting all of these things in it that make me tired and lethargic, and I'm not taking care of that temple, that there's a good chance that I'm not going to hear him the way that I'm used to when I'm, when I'm healthy. So is there an unhealthy habit that I won't give up a person that I won't forgive a wrong relationship in my life that I won't give up a restitution I won't make or something that God's already told me to do that I haven't obeyed. I've never found a sixth. And I'll tell you, and I'm, I'm telling you this honestly, that when I'm in a drift And I'm human. I just told you about a couple of things. Like my mind has the ability to go to dark places as a pastor, as one who has been walking with God, who is like a a stand-up Christian. There are times where I get discouraged. And I know that if it can happen for me, who is in the midst of a healthy, vibrant community, who has an incredible, loving wife, beautiful kids, a life that I look forward to leading, that it can really happen to anybody. And in the Bible, God used so many people who that had happened to, to do the greatest things in the world. And I'll tell every single one of you that I have never fell in love with a person. I have never been really touched by a person who was perfect. The speakers that I've loved the most, the people that I've connected with the most have all been people that have ish, that are human like me. Because when somebody's too perfect, I feel like I can't, I can't connect. Even Jesus, I don't love him for his perfection. I relate to him because I know that on the cross, he experienced every single sin that I have ever experienced, every single sin that humanity has ever experienced. And he is so 
relatable because of that. And to know that he took that on him and died for me as a punishment to bear a weight that I couldn't bear myself so that I could be set free and so that I could receive the power of his Holy Spirit that would let me go through life as a free person, able to do incredible things. There's three groups of people that I want to pray for today. And I didn't mention this in the earlier service, but I just feel like this is for this service. There there are some Christians, good Christians, that read Revelation. And they're looking around the times that we're living in now and are like wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all of these things happening. What what Jesus talked about in Matthew and seeing it through in Revelation and are just sitting around waiting for Christ to split the sky and separate the lambs from the goats. The Bible says that all prophecy is meant to edify All prophecy is meant to encourage. And so I asked myself this week, what is that encouraging me to do? Jesus taught his disciples to pray that your kingdom come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That the earth is meant to reflect heaven. And I wonder if we really took that seriously and not in a works-based way, but in a way that's life-giving, if we really trust it, that Jesus died and he gave us the spirit to empower us so that we actually had the power to bring heaven to earth. That we didn't just have faith for us to be saved and go to heaven, but we actually had faith for God's will to be done here. And God's will is that none should perish and all should be saved. What would happen if Christ split the sky and came back and there were no goats to separate because all of them had been saved? Do I believe that I could have a faith that's big enough for that? Or am I more concerned with the drift that I'm in? And I don't mean that as like, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I know that this last 20 months has been hard. And I know that there's circumstances that are really, really hard, but I want to tell you that there, God gave an answer to our circumstances 2000 years ago when he willingly went to the cross for us so that we could be set free. So I would love everybody in this place to bow your head and close your eyes. And if there are any of you that relate to being the Christian that's just waiting for that last trumpet to blow, you're waiting for Christ to split the sky and come back and separate the the sheep from the goats. And you are thinking, man, oh my gosh, I've felt so unempowered. I've suffered from like the devil's voter suppression. I've become discouraged but I have a little bit of hope that there's somebody that I could reach out to, that I could share the gospel with, I could let my life be more open to others. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If you are here and you are feeling like this has been a lot, and even in the, maybe even before COVID hit, you were feeling distant from God and you haven't been able to hear his voice. And one of the five things that I mentioned in that list, you're like, man, pastor, that's me. I want you to pray for me. In a moment, I want you to raise your hand. And the third group I want to pray for are ones that maybe have heard about Jesus, but don't actually know him and have never experienced the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. They may be coming to church. They may have all of this information, but they've never actually opened their lives up to be transformed. I want to pray for you too. So if you're in any of those three groups, will you raise your hand right now so I can include you in a prayer? God bless you, 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 God bless you. I see hands going up all over the place. Father God, thank you for what you're doing, that I knew you had uh, work and you're stirring in this, your spirit this morning. And God, thank you for bringing all of your lost sheep home. And I just want all of us to pray together for everybody that just uh, raised their hand in the couple of seconds that we have left. Will you all join me in this prayer? Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are always working. Even when I don't see it, you're working and you have a plan to prosper me and not to harm me. God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to take on the weight of my sin and die 
for my transgressions. God, I know that I don't deserve it, but that you love me. And so I thank you for saving me. I declare that heaven is my home, that God is my father, and that I have a plan and a purpose on this earth to bring heaven to the lost people that he died for in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com. 